Kim and I, we live right down the street from here, and we've lived in our present space for the last 12 years. And one of the things that really surprised us when we first moved in was the way our neighborhood celebrates Halloween. I didn't know it was such a huge holiday. In fact, if, if you base the importance of a holiday based on communal cooperation, Halloween is the biggest holiday of the year. All the houses down all the streets where we live decorate. They go to the max. There are Halloween lights and Halloween decorations. And, and then in our neighborhood, which is just an amazing thing, people bring their kids in cars and vans in buses. And probably at least a thousand kids go walking through our neighborhood every Halloween. And even though we're not the biggest fans of Halloween, we love it. Because we just love seeing all those little kids all dressed up, coming up, and, and giving them candy so they can all have diabetes. It's just like an incredible contribution to their lives. And, and, and it's always interesting to me how some kids are very specific. We only want these. Right? I'm gluten-free. And uh, only in our neighborhood. Halloween is huge, but then we get to Christmas. And Christmas, our neighborhood is dark. Our neighborhood just goes dark. You think everyone's out of town, but not our house. Our house is in the corner, and it is lit. It is lit up. And every year, I try to outdo myself. I only compete against me and Tim Allen. And, uh, and Kim's always nervous about what I'm going to do. And she's like, no, not this year. You know, pull, pull it back. She's... I don't know if you have someone in your life trying to keep you down, but that, that's, that's kind of my experience at Christmas with Kim. And I'm like, I have ideas, I have plans, I've been thinking about this all year long. And, and, and this year she made me commit to not light up a few of our giant trees, and, but, but we accidentally got blinking lights. I mean, the, the, the kind of lights that will send you into a seizure. They're just like amazing. And, and it turns the whole corner and, and the entire neighborhood knows that we celebrate Christmas. It's a sign. It's a sign to the entire neighborhood. And, and even if you aren't a huge fan of Christmas, you can't escape it. The signs are everywhere. And you can go the, you know, the more like spiritual track, or you can go the more like general audience track. You, know, you, you can go Jesus in the manger. You can go Santa Claus with the reindeers. But it, it's everywhere. The signs of Christmas are everywhere. But what, what if Christmas were a floating holiday? Like, it wasn't on the 25th, because we all know. And because it's on the 25th, we have a, a hard and fast rule in our home, established by Kim, that we cannot start celebrating Christmas until the day after Thanksgiving. Anybody have that rule? Because no, Thanksgiving. It's a holiday. And it is one of my favorites. I, we, I, I love a holiday that celebrates one of the most important values in my life, which is eating. And, uh, and gratitude, I mean. And, but the day after, we, we pivot, we shift. It's now Christmas, and we go nuts, and we go find that tree, and we want them delivered as quickly as possible, or go get it. And, and, but what if, what, what if we didn't know how many days it was until Christmas? Like it was a floating holiday. How, how would you manage that? How early would you put the lights up? How soon would you get the tree? Because have you ever got the tree a little too early? And it was dead by Christmas. It was just like really sad. Like this, all the pine needles have fallen off. And it's just got Charlie Brown Christmas tree. And we've had that because we forgot to water it. And, and what, what would happen if you, you didn't know? Oh, it's not this month. Maybe it's next month. Or maybe it's the month after that. Or, and and you, you got presents. And you've been waiting for a very particular present. And, and you recognize the size of the box. It's under the tree. But... But you can't open it until Christmas, but Christmas is a floating holiday. So you don't know when you're going to get it. Which is a real problem because it may not fit next year. And, and, and so you're waiting and waiting and waiting for it to, to happen, but it doesn't. You see, that, that's actually the world that the Hebrews lived in. They had a promise of a Messiah. The promise that God would step into human history. The promise that, in a sense, Christmas would happen. Because Christmas couldn't happen until Jesus stepped into human history. Christmas couldn't happen until God defied all reason and took on flesh and blood. Christmas couldn't happen until Bethlehem and Mary and Joseph and Jesus. But, but they knew about it for generations. Isaiah talked about it. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he says this. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son 
and we'll call him Emmanuel. So they knew. It had been foretold. Christmas was coming, but it was a floating Christmas. They thought it was going to happen soon. They thought it was going to happen with some level of urgency, but it didn't. And it didn't happen in their lifetime. Wouldn't that be terrible? You have your tree. How many trees would you get? Oh, that, that tree's dead. Let's go get another one. And you put up another Christmas tree because you're hopeful, because you understand it's going to happen soon. And so you get your second tree. And, and then it dies. And the presents are still there. You're wondering, should we open them? Should we wait? Are we going to break the rules? Do we keep the lights up? Lights are starting to burn out. And a generation passes, and two generations, and three generations. How much time would have to pass before you no longer believed it would happen? You think, oh, Christmas is just a myth. It's just an illusion. It never happens. It's never going to happen. Can you imagine being the Hebrews, being told that something so significant was going to happen that it would cause the liberation of all of your people, that, that God would actually intervene in human history, and step into time and space and take on flesh and blood and walk among them, but soon, but not now. So what would happen is after a while, you would stop believing. Say, I don't even think Christmas is a thing. I don't think this is ever going to happen. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that God's ever going to see this through. This is an empty, hollow promise. And, and, and so we shouldn't be surprised that when, when the moment of Jesus actually came to pass, that no one expected it. That, that no one could see the signs. And there were signs everywhere. And that, that's the, the whole narrative of Luke and Matthew is that there were signs everywhere letting them know that God was doing something so extraordinary, something so historic that it would change the course of human history, that God was stepping into history. There was a star and, and there were shepherds that, that knew, and then there was magi who knew, and there, there was all this activity happening, but most people were completely unaware that history was being written. Because they, they, they no longer believed there, there were any signs. There, there, there was no possibility that God was actually going to come through, and it says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And I think this is what happens so oftentimes in life. One of the things I discovered as I read the scriptures is that God is always giving us signs. And, and God is giving us signs of, of the very things we need most of himself. But also not just of himself in, in the grander scheme of, of God wanting a relationship with us, but God is trying to give us signs of how to live in relationship with him how to live this life out in connectedness to him, how to be on this journey in such a way that the fingerprint of God is all over your life. And, and I think for many of us, what hap has happened in our lives and what happened in the time of Jesus is that we be become blind to the signs. And it says the Lord himself will give you a sign. And my question is, to you is, do you see the signs? Are you paying attention to it? God is doing all around you. It, you may be here, and you may, you may have actually had a conversation with God without even believing him and saying, God, if you're out there, give me a sign. In fact, someone said that to me today. Someone drove from Tucson, Arizona, because their life was in collapse, saying, I've been asking God to give me a sign, so I drove here to be here this morning. But you can't see the signs. But there's signs everywhere. Probably the place where we look for the signs the most are when we call them symptoms. Right? You, you, you ever been to a doctor and he says, well, what are your symptoms? And you say, well, you know, I have a hard time breathing. I have a cough, feeling achy. And, and or you say, I have headaches and and I'm having, you know, instability, and, 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 and they always say, it's COVID, right? <laughs> because the symptoms are endless, right? Or I can't, I can't taste, or, or whatever it may be. And, and so they look at the symptoms, which are, by the way, are signs. But when something is a sign for the negative, it's called a symptom. But when it's hopefully something for the positive, it's called a sign. So no one ever... Goes to the doctor and says, hey, what are the signs? You go, no, what are the symptoms? And, and, and then, unfortunately, if you have the right combination of symptoms, it'll point to a particular 
problem and then they'll diagnose you, but those signs, those symptoms actually move them in a direction that could save your life. But why is it with God we're always looking for symptoms and not signs? So you, can, you can hear it in people, even people who do not believe in God. They say, I do not believe in God because there's so much suffering in the world. No, that's a symptom, not a sign. Why would you use a symptom to convince yourself there is no God and be blind to the signs all around you? When people say, well, I, I cannot believe in God because there's so much poverty in the world. I cannot believe in God because there's so much injustice in the world. And, and so people look at all the symptoms and they use that as a way to conclude there's no God, but the reality is all those symptoms are not about God, they're about us. Those are actually symptoms of our problem, injustice and violence and poverty. Those are symptoms of our sickness, not signs of God's absence. But there are signs of, well, of God. Every morning when you wake up and you take a deep breath and that oxygen matches what you need to live, that's a sign. It's not an accident, it's a sign. When you drink that water and it quenches your thirst and it's not toxic and it doesn't kill you, that's a sign that somehow the water on this planet was designed to give you life. And every single day when you eat food that is literally created out of the soil of this earth, it's a sign that everything's designed in your favor. And yet we ignore the signs all around us. But they're, they're oftentimes much more dramatic signs where God is trying to get your attention. And sometimes the signs are, you ever just had things go well? Just go, wow, these are, things are just way too good <laughs> to be me. I mean, I have a friend who, his name is Ken Blanchard, and he wrote a book called The One Minute Manager, and he came out of Harvard, and he became immensely successful, both in influence and in wealth. But he did not believe in God. And when I asked him, well, what actually caused you to believe in God? He said, the book did too well. It wasn't that good. <laughs> like, I was doing too well. I wasn't that good. It was all the goodness that was assigned to him that God was being good to him. Now, sometimes the signs are on the other end because, well, you make dumb choices. <laughs> and the signs cause pain. And it leaves you devastated and hurt and empty and frustrated and disappointed because you're pursuing all the wrong things and then you get mad at God, but those are just signs that you're pursuing the wrong things. And God's trying to redirect you in the right direction. And so when he says, and, and the Lord will give you a sign. By the way, that's consistent to life. Another friend that I was texting with this morning about the World Cup, did we mention Argentina? won the World Cup and defeated France, who I also love. But I love Argentina just a little bit more. And, and, and what a great sign that Messi is the greatest player who ever lived. And we were texting, but, but when I met John, it was through a podcast to his producer, Daniel Decker. And this guy reached out to me and said, would you come on the podcast with my boss, John Gordon? He's a Jewish Buddhist energy coach. I thought, wow, what a combination. So I went on his podcast about energy, and we're supposed to talk about energy. And halfway through, John goes, you're a Christian, right? And I go, well, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus. He goes, yeah, yeah, you're a Christian. You Christians think you're the only ones going to heaven. The rest of us are going to hell, right? I go, hey, that's not what this podcast is about. He goes, yeah, but my audience is interested. Do you think you're the only ones going to heaven? The rest of us are going to hell. And, and I remember in that moment thinking very carefully, and I said, well, you know, Jesus said he did not come to condemn the world, but to bring the world life. So, John, I'm not going to take on an occupation Jesus would take on, so I'm not here to condemn the world. I'm just here to bring the world life. He goes, oh, I like that. And then about three weeks later, he's texting me, this guy that I don't know, this Jewish Buddhist energy coach. And he's like, there are just signs everywhere, like everywhere I see Jesus. Because I am driving on the street and I see Jesus and on a billboard or I'm reading and there's Jesus and I just sing Jesus everywhere. Well, Jesus was there before. <laughs> but he, he initiated a conversation that he didn't realize God had already initiated with him. 
And he was looking for a reason not to believe, and God was giving him a reason to believe. But now he, there were just signs everywhere. And I just, I just kind of love the way God works sometimes because because God kind of plays toward our OCD. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, you, you don't get it because you, you're, you're, you're not subtle. So God gives you the sign of creation, but you're like, yeah, there's no proof of God. So God's okay, I'm going to be a little more directive. And then he just starts pounding on you. Here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am. And some of you didn't realize that people in your life are signs. They're people that God brings into your life that somehow, even though you respect them, they do believe. And, and their lives become proof of God. They become the signs, and you become the sign to other people. And, but the question is, do you see the signs? Or are you blind to them? Do you only see the symptoms? Wouldn't it be great if we actually went to the doctors with signs, not symptoms? Okay, what's going on? I, don't, I feel great. Like, well, yeah, but what, what specifically? I don't know. I wake up with energy. Mm. Right? Like, yeah, but anything else? Yeah, I have mental clarity. <laughs> anything else? Yeah, I'm getting older, but I feel stronger. It's like, I, yeah, it's like, yeah, all my, you know, like, no pulled muscles? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a non-symptom. My muscles are growing. I don't know what's going on. I'm losing body fat. It, it, what do you think it is? I think it's called health. But we don't do that. We only look for symptoms, not for signs. And so we're programmed like that. And it's the same way with God. When we see things go bad, we go, that's proof God isn't in our life. And when things go good, we go, see, look how awesome I am. But when you begin to see the signs, you have to begin to ask the question, what is the sign calling you to believe? It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Listen to what's next. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. Now, I know that many of us are, are, are accustomed to hearing that phrase. The virgin will believe, uh, will, will conceive, and give birth to a son. But I want you to realize that's weird. Okay? Let's just say it, okay? Because we're supposed to go, oh, that's awesome. It's so romantic. It's so beautiful. That's just strange. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. No one is hearing that going, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Isaiah's not writing this down going, just what I thought. I think Isaiah's like writing this down going, you sure? You sure? Because this would be like no sex, all right? This is like, this is skipping a massively important step in the process of conception. And God said, no, I got this. See, I need to give you a sign that's undeniable. I need to give you a sign so that you know that this person is different than any other person who's ever lived or will ever live. And that's the, the really the amazing thing about the virgin birth is that you should not believe it easily. See, if you're here and you're going, yeah, no, that makes sense. You're not thinking. You're not thinking. You think about other beliefs and go, that's stupid. But then when you believe it, you go, yeah, that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. You just need to accept that. Right? Because like, it never happened before. And it never happened again. It was like a one time. And only it could have been weirder. And I shouldn't say this, but I'm just saying, is if a guy had a baby, right? Like, you know, but I'm, I'm, glad, I'm just really glad that God did not feel like the sign needed to be that significant, right? You know, because that would be terrifying just to know that one guy in history had a baby. But you're thinking, yeah, that couldn't happen. That's right. Neither could this. Neither could this. You see, God was going to make something happen that could not happen. And whenever God gives you a sign, he's calling you to believe something that you shouldn't believe. That goes beyond belief, outside of your belief. God isn't ever going to call you to do things that you already know you can do. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to get up this morning and take a shower. I don't know why I didn't think of that. You know, I was like, get dressed. I think, I think a lot of us want God to micromanage our lives, right? But he, but he doesn't. And I, I hear people, because sometimes, sometimes Christians are weird. I, I just could say that. Like, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I was just praying about what I should wear today. I'm like, really? And that's what you heard? Right? You know, I was like, you know. <laughs> I, I just, straight up, like, you don't know how many times I'm heading the mosaic, and my wife, Kim, says to me, is that what you're wearing today? 
Uh, you know, I'm just wearing this to the car. <laughs> and I'm going to change in the car before I get to church. And now, she went to South Pass today, so she did not see me. So I came here this way. But, but you know, a lot of times, because she's, she's out for my well-being, so she's like, don't wear that. I go, okay, how about this? Now, sometimes it takes three times before I get house approval to go outside. <laughs> but you know what's weird? God will not micromanage you like that. Because he's not trying to pull you out of stupid. He's trying to actually move you to extraordinary. He's trying to teach you how to make everyday decisions all on your own. And whenever God is calling you to something, it's always something that you're going to struggle to believe. So if you already think you can do it, God's not calling you to it. He's calling you to more. He's calling you to the impossible. He's calling you to the improbable. He's calling you to that thing that shakes you and makes you nervous and makes you uncomfortable and makes you wonder if you're out of your mind. That's what God calls you to. See, what, see God doesn't go, okay, here's the sign. A woman's going to have a baby. Great. Which one? No, I'm going to make it real easy. It's that one. The one that is a virgin and has not had sex, that's the one that's going to have a baby, and it's going to be a miracle because you cannot explain it. It cannot happen that way except by my hand. I'm convinced that God is trying to give you a sign for your life. And then with that sign, he's trying to call you to believe something that goes beyond your wildest imagination. He's trying to call you to a bigger life and a greater faith, to call you to greater courage. And, and, and until you see the signs that are saying, God, I can't do that, you're not in the conversation yet. And by the way, the longer you walk with God, the more challenging that sign will be. Because early on in my life, I needed God to give me courage to do simple things. And, and then those things became simple. And then I had the next challenge. I needed God to get me to the next challenge, and then those things became a part of me. And what I've realized is, is that what, what took faith for me 30 years ago doesn't take for me any faith at all. But what took faith for me 20 years ago and 10 years ago and five years ago is just ordinary living for me now. And the old level of faith that you had, it's not good enough for the life God is calling you into now. You know it's yours when God starts to shake you. Oh, and by the way, you know how you know you're in the right conversation? When you're having a hard time understanding. Is this really you, God? Isn't it interesting that whenever God says something that we want, we get it right away? Oh, yeah, yeah, God's speaking to me, yeah. He says, go to Fiji. He's just like, he's saying, and I can go to the Maldives. He's telling me to get away and, you know, to refresh myself. I can just hear his voice so clearly. And it's, it, whenever it's something you want, it's so clear. It's when it's something you don't want where you just, I don't know if that's really God. I'm not really, really sure about that. It's true in human relationships, by the way. I mean, Kim and I have been married almost 40 years. And you know when we have our biggest fights? When we miscommunicate. And it's so easy to miscommunicate. Like she'll say something to me that she perceives to be really clear and I hear something else. I hear what I want to hear. But I think she's saying it. So later, when she says, I was so clear, I go, yeah. And I did exactly what you said. She goes, no, you did the opposite of what I said. No, this is what you said. She goes, it's not what I said. And so I've realized, she said what she said. And I heard what I heard. And we're living in two different Expressions of the multiverse, <laughs> and yet we're married. You see, the greatest conflicts are when someone talks to you about something you don't want to hear, and you get blurry, you get confused. You see this all the time. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was sitting with, with Joe, and I, I started sharing an idea with him of something I wanted to change, and he acted on it instantly. I didn't even know he was, he sent out like a, a memo 
And then I changed my mind. And I didn't realize he had already sent it out to everyone. And later I said, Joe, I see you. You, you wanted to do that, and that's why you acted so fast. Like, I'm going to move so he can't reverse it. And uh, <laughs> like I tell you, there are other times I've said things to Joe, and he moves super, super slow. Like, I'm saying, like, this man is like quicksand and molasses at the same time. And, 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 it, and I don't know if, you know, your wife, Bex, has experienced this, but, you know, it's amazing. Your speed changes based on your agreement. I think we're all that way with God. Like, do you really believe in Jesus or do you believe in you when Jesus agrees with you? Like, do you really believe in the scriptures or do you believe in you when the scriptures agree with you? Like, there's usually not a lot of confusion with some of the Ten Commandments, like do not kill. Like, I never have people coming to me going, but what does this mean? Okay. I, mean, just, I don't know if I've ever had that conversation with, and even with all the sociopaths that we have. Like, in, you know, in L.A., no one's ever come to me and says, well, what does it mean to not murder? Usually people go, I get it, I get it. Like, I, I probably shouldn't kill people. And I go, yeah, that's a good application of that. It's a, most people get that. Even, like, do not steal. Most, most people get that, except with their taxes <laughs> or with someone else's boyfriend. And uh, right? then what does it mean to steal exactly, right? You know, and, and it gets a little blurry, right? Wow, I feel the tension in the room, right? You know, and, like, what does it mean to do, do not lie or bear false witness? Like, most of the time we know that it means, like, don't purposely deceive another human being, except when it's for their good, right? And, but, but most of us get those. It's, it's the ones we don't like. See, whenever God speaks to you or to me, and it's something we don't like, we go, I, I'm not really sure. I don't know if that's clear. I've had people come to me about different issues in their life. They go, but yeah, but what do, you, what do you think the Bible says about this? That doesn't help. It doesn't help what I think the Bible says about it. I usually just open up to the passage that actually relates to it, and I'll let them read it and go, you read it. Because like, maybe my interpretation's off. So you read it out loud, and then you tell me what it says. It's usually really clear. And I, I think it's way better. I think it's more honest with ourselves and with God to go, I just disagree with God. Or if you don't think it's that clear, just go, I just disagree with the scriptures. Or I just disagree with Jesus. Or I just agree with me. And, and that way you have clarity because, you see, Whenever God's going to give you a sign, he's going to give you a sign, and that sign's going to call you to believe something. And if you believe the opposite, you will not reconsider it until you find yourself lost. And when you pursue your own direction and your own way and your own mind, and you finally come to the end of yourself, I don't want you to pretend you were following God. I would much rather you say, hey, I'm tapping out. I just do not agree with Jesus. I do not agree with the scriptures. I just don't agree with this. I'm going to live my life my way and just see how it goes. And that way, when you're there by yourself, struggling and really, really reflecting on it, you'll know God didn't take you there. And then you'll begin to see the signs because God already has a plan to get you back to the life you're created to live. Because God always has signs for you to get you where you need to go. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth. And that sign is calling you to believe. What's, what is God calling you to believe right now? Well, what is it right now that God wants to shake up in your life? And, and I think a lot of times it's about self-belief. See, maybe God, God believes more about you than you believe about yourself. Maybe you've believed a lot of lies about you. And you think that you're less than God thinks. Maybe what you need to hear is the voice of God saying, why are you letting them define you? Why are you letting other people tell you what your limitations are? Why are you letting other people limit your future, your capacity, your dreams, your ambitions? I find that whenever you start hearing God speak, he starts pulling you into the impossible. And then the signs also call you to go. 
And you need to ask yourself, do I see the signs? And, and what are the signs calling me to believe? And, and where are the signs calling me to go? The last part of this verse says, and they will call him Emmanuel. I, I just love this. One, God has a lot of names. Jesus has a lot of names, right? He's like, that's how you know he's Latino. Right? Because like, <laughs> my birth certificate, my, my names are like a paragraph long. And Irwin and McManus are not on there. But I just, I have so many names. And Jesus has a bunch of them. But one of them is Emmanuel. Jesus is a great name. It means Savior. But Emmanuel means God with us. And God wants us to understand that what he's giving us a sign for is to find him. And so that we can live in communion with him. God with us. I mean, it's a miracle that, that God would somehow take on flesh and blood and, and recreate himself in the womb of a woman. That is astonishing to me. But that miracle is replicated in the most powerful ways. Because every time a person opens up their life to God, God comes to dwell within them. And even though God isn't born again, we are. And what God wants for our life is for us to live a life where God is with us because we are with him. God was so distant to them. When Isaiah was writing these words, God felt like some transcendent other in another space, another time, another dimension, another universe. And he writes these words down. He says, God's end game is intimacy with you to bring you back to himself. That's God's ultimate intention. That's why there's a, an environment around this season that infuses hope and joy and laughter and love. Because wherever God is present, there's love. Wherever God is present, there's, there's hope. Wherever God is present, there is life. And, and, and one of the ways you can check your barometer is when you're moving toward hope and faith and love and life, you're moving toward God. And when you feel hope leaving your soul, when you feel faith leaving your soul, when you feel love leaving your soul, you can know you're moving further and further and further away from God. And your soul desperately needs God's presence. It's been a hard week. And, um, you know, one of our friends, Stephen Boss, who people know as Twitch, uh, took his life this week. And, and as a family, we've known this way too much. People we uh, love and care about and come to know. Not seeing the signs that they matter. That they're loved. That there's hope, that there's a future. And in, in the middle of, of that um, scenario, I got a DM from someone that said, I just want you to know that when I came to Mosaic, I was suicidal, and Mosaic saved my life. And I've been coming for years, and I've struggled with this off and on, and Mosaic just keeps saving my life. And, and, and more than any one of us, it is God who knows how desperately we need him. We're, we're, we're able to hide from everyone, but we can't hide from God. And it, it, it's, the story is just, it's just too recurring of people who bring inspiration and hope and happiness and laughter to others are, um, are living a tragedy in the privacy of their own life and soul. And we got to stop acting like the things in this life actually fill that hole. They don't. There is not enough fame. 
or wealth or power or possessions that fill that deep longing inside of us. That's the place that only God can heal. The vacuum that only God can fill. He doesn't fill it by anything he gives us other than himself. You know, when our kids were little, we would buy them Christmas gifts, mostly because we liked them because they were too small to know. And it would always be so almost frustrating. They would rip the wrapping paper off, open up the box, pull out the gift, look at it for like a second, throw the gift to the side and play with the box. And it really struck me how this is what we do. Because whenever we talk about God, it's what is going wrong. Whenever we talk about the universe, it's what's going right. God is against us, the universe is for us. But that's like being a child who doesn't actually thank the person who gives the gift and doesn't actually appreciate the gift. It just likes the package. Because God is the giver of the gift and Jesus is the gift. The universe is just a package. And what we need to realize is that there has to come a point in our life where we grow up and we realize what's inside the package is far more important than the box. The universe is amazing. I'm really impressed by it. I'm astonished by what God has created, the complexity, the detail, the attention to every aspect of how the universe is held together will always fascinate me. But that's, that's the packaging for life. That's why this planet sustains you. That's why we exist in this small speck of dust in this massively expansive universe. And we have consciousness and we can be aware of our existence. Is this the package? And if the package is that extraordinary, how more extraordinary is the gift and the giver of that gift? But what will it take? What kind of sign are you going to need to stop existing and start living? What kind of sign does God need to send you to shake you up and wake you up so that you would live the life he created you to live? I was in a conversation last night with Matt Pagan, who you know, is a pro surfer. And so they, he goes back and forth a lot of times to Hawaii and and, it, and he was telling me about how in 2018, something extraordinary happened in Hawaii on January 13th. Let me just read what the newspaper alert said. The Hawaii Emergency Management Services worker who sent the false alert warning of an incoming ballistic missile this month had a long history of poor performance and sent the warning because he thought the state faced an actual threat. The mistake, which touched off panic and confusion across Hawaii on January 13, 2018, occurred when the worker misinterpreted testing instructions from a supervisor. Believing the instructions were for a real emergency, the worker, who has not been identified, sent the live alert to the cell phones of all Hawaii residents and visitors to the state. When prompted with the question, are you sure you want to send this alert, the employee clicked yes. Panic set across Hawaii almost immediately with people ferociously contacting members of their families and seeking shelter. The escalating tension between the United States and North Korea added to the level of concern. It took about 38 minutes to send a second alert that said the original one was an error. So every person in Hawaii saw this. Emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. 
For 38 minutes, everyone in Hawaii thought their life was going to end. They had 38 minutes to make up for lost time and time expected but not promised. They had 38 minutes to tell everyone they loved that they loved them. 38 minutes to grab someone that they cared about to spend those last moments together. 38 minutes, I don't know, to get a, a martini and to act like nothing matters in life. 38 minutes because life is going to end abruptly. And of course, it was a false alarm. But it was actually rooted in truth because life is ending for all of us. And the problem is that we act as if we have forever in this life. Aaron and I were talking the other day, and he goes, when I get to God, I want to have a conversation with him about death. Why death? Why did he think this was a good idea? And I've been thinking about that. It's, it's a hard one, right? But I, I, I've realized that if there was not physical death in this world, we would never believe anything God said about the mess that we're in. We would not believe our souls needed healing. We would not believe that we need forgiveness. We would not believe that there's something bigger than this moment if there wasn't an end date. What kind of alert does God need to send you to help you realize this is your sign from God? Jesus has stepped into human history. God himself has walked among us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he died on the cross so that you could have a relationship with him and live in forgiveness and freedom. Would you just bow your heads with me just for a moment? Just close your eyes. Can you see the signs? The signs all around you that maybe you've been ignoring, can you see the signs? The signs that God is trying to get your attention. The signs that God's trying to get you to accept his love, to accept his forgiveness. Do you see the signs that you don't have to stay broken? You don't have to stay empty. You don't have to do this all alone. Can you see the signs? If you're here and you don't need one more sign, you're ready to give your life to Jesus. You're ready to cross the line of faith. You're ready to put your trust in the God who loves you and to make Jesus your Lord. I want you to pray this simple prayer right now. Jesus, I give you my life right now. Just tell him. Jesus, I give you my life. If that's your commitment today, if in this moment you've said, Jesus, I give you my life, if today is the beginning of a new relationship with you and God, I want to pray for you. If you just whispered that prayer, Jesus, I give you my life, I want you just to raise your hand right now so I can see you. Beautiful, 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 wonderful. Anyone else? Amazing, beautiful. Hold it up real quick so I can keep seeing all of you. Beautiful. How oh, so good. Father, just so many, so many people here in this moment have opened up their lives to you, God. I'm just so grateful that you're the God who's always giving us signs of your goodness, signs of your mercy, signs of your compassion, signs of your love. And I pray right now, God, you would just wrap them up in your love. Let them know they belong to you, that you'll never leave them. Pray that today would be a defining moment in their life, that that God, they just acknowledge the sign that Jesus is through his life and death and resurrection, that Jesus is the sign of your love for us. I pray we would not miss the sign of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just thank God for all of those who just responded to him right now? So good. Hey, 
Guys, before um, Pastor come up, just one last thing. You know, I, I didn't mention um, Stephen in the last talk because it just it just feels really tender. But I just want to make something like clear in our community here. You're not alone. And if you're struggling and you're um, battling even like suicidal thoughts, this, that's not a battle you want to fight alone. Just grab a friend, grab someone. They may not know how to help you, but they'll help you find a way to get help. You're just not alone. Don't, don't, don't do that. When we need to lean into people is when we tend to fall away from people. And by the way, you are the sign for so many people. If you are a follower of Jesus, you're the sign of hope and joy and life and love and tomorrow for people. So don't, don't overestimate how important you are in someone's life. There's so many other things you can fight about, so many things we can disagree about, so many things that we can argue about. And like, aren't there plenty of things that we could all just like be different about? But in this, we need to be the same. We need to be for each other. And we need to be conduits of love, letting people know that Jesus has come for them. And so this Christmas, be a sign. 